Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here and finally I get to do my review of the Beatles magnificent albums Rubber Soul and Revolver. You know, if I'm forced to admit it, these two albums are my very favorite Beatle albums, and I'll explain that in a moment. You know, to me in my head, these two Beatle albums sit in a particular time period for the Beatles, that mid Beatle period, as many of us like to call it. Now, that mid Beatle period didn't start with these two albums. It actually had started with the preceding album before Rubber Soul, and of course, I'm talking about Help. And it could even be said that some of the mid Beatle forward movement, that mid Beatle sound, was starting to be achieved on Beatles for Sale. But you know, it's with these two albums, the Beatles for the very first time presented us intentionally with an album that should be listened to as an album, not just because it may contain a single or two on those albums. You know, and for you Led Zeppelin fans out there, you could compare these two albums to a couple of Led Zeppelin albums. I know, the style isn't exactly the same, but there are approaches to both recording these albums, even similarities in musical styles, musical roads taken. You know, by the time Led Zeppelin was on the scene, the Beatles were already history. And with the Beatles' total catalog at 12 plus albums, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to fully count Yellow Submarine, folks. But you know, when you look at that, that, that great body of work, and you realize that Led Zeppelin would take an even longer time to culminate eight studio albums at the time when John Bonham was still alive, we see that Led Zeppelin would cover in one album or two albums what the Beatles would in three or four sometimes. But folks, the pattern, the pattering of these albums are almost identical. Now let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And please keep in mind, when we're talking about Led Zeppelin, I'm not gonna go in chronological order all the time here, although there is a basic order that is similar to the development of the Beatles and their albums. Okay, so just think of all the territory the Beatles covered in their first two albums, along with their fourth album, Beatles for Sale, and probably about half of the songs on Help. It's in these albums that the Beatles really truly carve out that Beatles sound. Not unlike Led Zeppelin's first two albums. We have that carving out of the Led Zeppelin sound with the first album and the refining of that sound with Led Zeppelin II. Very similar to Please Please Me and with the Beatles. In Please Please Me, we have a general idea of what the Beatles sound like. And with the Beatles, that Beatles sound starts to arrive. And if you've seen any of my videos on the Beatles and their albums, I make that point really clear. And with the exception of the album, A Hard Day's Night, which is their very first classic as far as I'm concerned, they would continue to develop that sound over four full albums. Those albums, of course, being Please Please Me, with the Beatles, Beatles for Sale, and about half of the songs on Help. Interestingly enough, it's on Help where we start seeing the mid-period arise and a little bit with Beatles for Sale as well, right? Here they're establishing their first real good basic style, much like Led Zeppelin does with their first two magnificent albums. Now, with these two albums, though, the mid-period sound has fully arrived with, of course, Revolver, where we see the Beatles starting to depart just a bit from this mid-period sound. So if I were to compare these two albums to two Led Zeppelin albums, I see Rubber Soul as Led Zeppelin III and Revolver as their magnificent album, their very best album, Led Zeppelin IV, or Zoso, or Four Symbols. And the reason I say that is it's with Rubber Soul that we see them starting to depart from their original Beatles sound, don't we? Just like on Led Zeppelin III, Led Zeppelin starts to pepper through the album some nice acoustic blended songs, a clear departure from what they had attained 
on their first two albums. And with Revolver, of course, we see the full perfection of this entire approach. Just like with Led Zeppelin IV, we see the perfection of everything that came before. Now, don't get me wrong with what I've already said regarding how Revolver is even a more evolved sound. It is, but I gotta tell you, I don't like Revolver any better than I like Rubber Soul. As a matter of fact, Rubber Soul and Revolver are my two very favorite Beatle albums. You know, it's during this period the Beatles have mastered their style. They would go on and modify that style, even achieving higher levels of songwriting, but not better levels ever. I'll compare the very best Beatle tracks from this mid-period to the very best Beatle tracks from their latter period. Now, of course, I'm talking about the English versions of these albums, although I do have to admit, I do kind of like the American version of Rubber Soul. But knowing that's not what the Beatles intended, I got on board as soon as I realized there were actually English versions of these albums available. As you can see, both albums benefit from the very best artwork on any rock album throughout the 60s or the 70s. As a matter of fact, I'm so much of a fan of Klaus Vormann's artwork, I've got a clock behind me that replicates the artwork on his work on the anthology albums. But second rate compared to Rubber Soul, this is my very favorite rock album cover of all time. Yes, even over Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and yes, even over the magnificent artwork that I discussed in my last video of Houses of the Holy by Led Zeppelin. Now, why do I feel this way? Well, partly, the Beatles never looked this good ever again in another photograph, as far as I can tell. All four Beatles look at their very best, man. And as a young teenage fan, when I saw this album, all I wanted to do was look like any one of the Beatles. I'd be happy for the rest of my life. Of course, the photograph isn't a true representation of what the Beatles actually looked like. You see, this is a cover by Robert Freeman who did all of their covers up to this album, this being his very last album, that he would photograph a cover for the Beatles. You see, when he was showing them this photograph, he was showing them it through an overhead projector. I guess the photo fell down, and what that did was elongate the Beatles' faces. Paul and the other Beatles immediately jumped on the idea. Yeah, that's what we want our album to look like. That's it, perfect. And so with a little bit of photography trickery, Robert Freeman shot what is, in my opinion, rock's preeminent rock cover. But once again, just like what I mentioned about Houses of the Holy with Led Zeppelin, this is not an empty promise. This isn't just a great album cover. The material, the songs, the explorations on this album are absolutely marvelous and just as groundbreaking as the changes that Led Zeppelin provided us with their third magnificent album. Now, there's another thing I want to bring out here. These two albums represent, when you take them collectively, as the best representation of both John Lennon and Paul McCartney writing evenly. Now, that's not true per album here, but when you take both of these albums and look at the totality of the work, John Lennon and Paul McCartney are almost dead heat in being represented as the primary writers on these songs. In Rubber Soul, we see John slightly ahead of Paul in his song offering output. Now, this is a natural extension of what had occurred before. John had always had more songs, generally speaking, on all of their albums up to this point. To the point that on their third album, A Hard Day's Night, John writes 10 of the 13 songs on that album. It's with Revolver that we see Paul just barely edging out John 
in song output. Of course, Paul would continue to slightly dominate John from this point on, unless you count their magnificent White Album, where John, once again, I think he provided one more song than Paul. But you know, there is that little snippet of Paul's, Can You Take Me Back Where I Came From? On the White Album, they're almost equal again, which is why that is my second favorite Beatle album. Now you may ask yourself, what do you mean, Michael? Your second favorite? You just told me that these two are your favorite. It would have to be number three, right? No, no, no. You see, the way I look at Rubber Soul and Revolver, the two R albums, by the way, is that I look at them as almost an official double album unto themselves. Now, even George Harrison backs up my claim here. He said both albums were very pleasant to make, that he had finally gotten a total of five songs between the two, and that he thought that both albums were really part A and part B of each other. So, with that announcement from the Beatles, I want you to kind of take a look, just for tonight, these two albums as almost a double album. You know, you could do the same thing with the Led Zeppelin comparison of three and four. Can you imagine if that had been presented as a double album? Physical graffiti would have had trouble getting out the door. Now, I've already mentioned a couple of differences between the album. There's also another difference. The Beatles were heavily influenced by marijuana on Rubber Soul, as they had been for quite a bit of the filming for help. By the time they get down to recording Revolver a year later, three out of the four Beatles had already experienced acid. And it's clear on some of the songs on the second album here that that was so. But you know, both albums have that kind of mid-60s swing, with Rubber Soul being more of a European sounding album and Revolver actually sounding like a new kind of world music at times. Here we see finally, as I stated before, between these two albums, George Harrison has five, not just five, but five of his very finest compositions. And there's also another slight difference between these two albums. You see, it's with Rubber Soul where the Beatles really perfect the four track. They have one four track predominantly on this album, and they fill those four tracks in very clever ways at times. Except there's a couple of tracks on the next album where they actually use two four tracks in conjunction, basically setting them up with what would normally be a six track machine. For a full coverage on some of this stuff, take a look at my previous videos on Rubber Soul and Revolver. And you know, finally, there is another basic difference between Rubber Soul and Revolver, and that's of recording engineers. On Rubber Soul, we have Norman Smith, the very same engineer who, along with George Martin, developed the Beatles sound. On the next album, Revolver, we see the arrival of Jeff Emmerich as their pretty much permanent sound engineer from this point on. And you know, both engineers have completely different ways of approaching recording. Norman Smith, of course, championed the room sound with more distant miking and Jeff Emmerich adding more punch to certain instruments by up-close miking techniques. But you know, for all of these differences between these two albums, somehow they hold almost an identical identity in my head. Now that's not to say there aren't weaker cuts on these albums, or at least to my ears, maybe you don't hear that. But you know, on Rubber Soul, if they hadn't recorded ever what goes on, I wouldn't have been unhappy. And you know, I know, to even dare to criticize Revolver as having any weak spots is suicidal these days. But you know, if I'm perfectly honest, I think John delivered a couple of weaker tunes on Revolver. First of all, a necessary tune. It needed to be on Revolver. It's a good song, but it's just not one of my favorite Beatles songs. And that is, of course, I'm Only Sleeping. Now, don't get me wrong, some of the backwards echoes and everything, and if you're in your right mood with this song, it sounds wonderful. You know, it's just that I think that John Lennon did a much better version of this song on the White Album with I'm So Tired. Now there, that song sells me. 
And I know I'm going to get some criticism on this next song that I choose as a weaker cut on a revolver, but I have never liked the song Dr. Robert. Especially when they get into that well, 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 you know, that whole part. To me, that sounds like they're throwing in a Christmas song in the middle of a song that's talking about a guy that's turning them on to acid. Now, I'm all for the Beatles sounding Christmassy. They are the ultimate Christmas gift every year when I was growing up. But on this track, that part just somehow, I don't know. John sounds a little too tongue in cheek on this song. You know, it was right around this time either with the recording of Rubber Soul or Revolver that John actually took Paul aside and said, you know, I like your cuts better than mine. And I've always suspected he was talking about Revolver. But you know, if they had even taken those two tracks off the album, I think John is still very well represented on this album. First of all, the magnificent She Said, She Said, based on a very uncomfortable conversation he had with actor Peter Fonda. But you know, it's this this song where we see John Lennon at his very best, his free thought grasp of the lyrics. You know, I've talked about how Robert Plant was excellent at this, just developing lyrics almost in a way that he's just expressing the song in the same fashion that he talks. I love that approach to songwriting. And of course, if you've seen any of my videos, you all know that my favorite Beatle track of all time is the magnificent Eleanor Rigby. And you know, talk about free flow lyric writing. Paul McCartney shows that he can occasionally do the same thing himself. How about for no one? On Rubber Soul, John asked, did they tell her that pain would lead to pleasure? Oh, what a wonderful phrase. But what about Paul on Revolver? And behind her eyes, you see nothing. No sign of love behind the tears. Cries for no one. Wonderful writing. Who says the man isn't a lyricist? But you know, it's this free form type of lyric writing on these two albums that I hear on Led Zeppelin albums with Robert Plant as a lyricist. And don't even get me started about the magnificent Tomorrow Never Knows. What a song. What a recording. You know, it's on this song that Paul went home and did a lot of thinking and came back with a little bag of tape loops that he had developed over previous months, just experimenting with taped sounds. And with these added in to this magnificent song with some very advanced recording techniques and even recording approaches, some of which, which we covered in my video on Jeff Emmerich and his recording techniques of Revolver. But you know, even on Rubber Soul, we hear the Beatles pushing the boundaries, don't we? How about George Harrison's sitar on Norwegian Wood? How about the lyrics suggesting that the character within the song sets the woman's house on fire? A suggestion, by the way, from all people by Paul McCartney. On both of these albums, we really start to see Paul McCartney opening up and broadening as a songwriter. From Good Day Sunshine to Got to Get You Into My Life, a song he dedicated to pot, to songs with very serious lyrics concerning what would become eventually his breakup with his longtime girlfriend, Jane Asher. Now, of course, on the first album, we get two wonderful songs by George Harrison, if not dour songs. Think for yourself and If I Needed Someone. But on both of these songs, we see that George has really starting to arrive as a songwriter here. And this fact only hinted at in the previous Help album. And on Revolver, he gets three songs. On a single disc, he would never get this many songs on a Beatle album. Yes, he got four songs on the White Album, but that's two long player LPs. Actually, if you think about it, that's still his two songs per album allotment. But on Revolver, he gets three tunes and they're wonderful. First of all, the magnificent Taxman. Here we see George Harrison trying his hand at social commenting, and he does a pretty damn good job, if you ask me. On Love You Too, we see the direction that George Harrison is starting to turn, a direction that we will see very well developed on their very next album, 
Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And we'll talk about that in future videos. But you know what? On that album, my very favorite cut, it isn't a day in a life. It isn't Sgt. Pepper's. It is within you and without you. I love this song. And finally, I want to tell you, you know, they used to use a snippet of this recording in the Bay Area on local channels just before showing old movies from the 30s and 40s. They would just have that part where the guitar goes gong dong, go down, go down, down, go down, down. Growing up as a kid, I always thought this song was very, very sophisticated. And you know what? It has an identity all on its own, an identity that George never really further explored. This is one of his songs that he would write and it would just sit there by itself over the years and I love it. You know, I've said it before, I almost, almost wish the Beatles had stayed in their mid-period. We would have still gotten amazing songs, brand new songs, and this style, this bit of approach with the Beatles, I just appreciated it so much, I was almost sad to see it go, almost, until I heard Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. All right, so that about wraps up the video today. I want to say thank you to everybody who's been viewing the channels. Our views are skyrocketing. I can't believe it. But you know, I'm even more impressed with the amount of new subscribers. If you're seeing any names in front of me right now, these are brand new subscribers, folks. And I always like to do a bit of a shout out at the end of my videos. Of course, a big shout out to fellow channels, Tudor Smith, a great channel with Beetle Lore Galore, and of course Beetle Dave, where his channel focuses on vinyl releases, not just vinyl releases, but specialty items. He's got a great channel over there. And of course, the R&B show hosted by Ron and Bruce. These guys have a bit longer format to their video, but that allows them to get into the meat of a subject. And if you're the kind of viewer who likes to just sit down and let's discuss this in full, you're gonna love their channel. And of course, a big shout out to Royce in the house. You know, Royce has really been almost adoptive of me. I kind of discovered his channel and just started watching his videos, you know? And it, it, it was his almost storytelling kind of way of hosting his videos, no matter what he was discussing, that first attracted me to the channel. But I'll tell you, they've really kicked it up a notch recently. You see, recently he's been almost co-hosting with drummer Lou Mars, and what they've been doing is discussing a variety of rock topics. All right, so that's my review, my comparison of these two magnificent Beatle albums, Rubber Soul and Revolver. I'm currently right now putting together my video to cover Led Zeppelin's magnificent physical graffiti. What a job that's going to be. I've just barely begun listening to these, and as you guys know, I take a few days to listen, and then I start developing my notes, and then it comes out, and I can't wait to cover that album by Led Zeppelin. And I've also got a couple of videos I think will surprise you here coming up. All right, this is The Bottom Line. I'm Michael Noland, and I'll see you in the next video.